Hey everyone, it's Daniel Elwood and Robert Johnson, The Last Nighters. And The Last Nighters can be found on Launchpad Media, where they're always launching new ideas, new direction. Check it out at thelaunchpadmedia.com. You can also check out this show and show notes and everything else at lastnighters.com slash 114. This is the 114th episode of the show. We just did Contagion, and the week before that, we did Batman. So we're, we're making the, uh, we're, we're closing the loop here. We're going from bats to Contagion to smallpox blankets. We're going to be talking about the last of the Mohicans tonight with Mike C., uh, we will uh, uh, show him on screen, on screen. There, Star Trek action right there. How you doing, Mike? Welcome back to the show. You do music uh, under the handle Mechanical Dream Revolution. It's very, uh, very trance-like, very lengthy, has a lot of clips from movies and television shows, news, sick beats, nice drops. And it, uh, we were talking in the pre-show, which is available for our Patreon supporters at lastnighters.com slash Patreon. We talked for an hour and we, we touched very heavily on your, on your music and what the, um, what did I call it? I, I called it, uh, some sort of a long form meme, uh, to get it into the subconscious. So welcome to the show. We will have a, a link to that, uh, on our show notes page, of course. Um, but how, yeah, introduce, describe, uh, speak. How much uh, you yeah. Uh, what it is, uh, my name is Mike. I like music, and I'm two thirds libertarian. And uh, yeah, I've known you guys for well, a while now, a couple years anyway. Yeah, it's like been movies. a few years. Uh, a few good I, years. I found you guys because I was looking for literally a libertarian or anarchist analysis of film, and I put that into the the internet machine, and it gave me a few options, and you guys rose to the top. So sick. Yeah. That is, we never heard this before. This is great. Um, no, I just, yeah. yeah, I was like, I need some, I need an anarchist podcast and, you know, like, so, um, yeah, I call myself an anarchist more than a libertarian, I think, but, uh, pragmatic. I think I've, I think I've, I think I've, uh, told you guys I'm a little, a little more pragmatic. In, uh, yeah. More of a yeah. prag. Well, I'll <sighs> tell you what, when we came up with, uh, hmm. one of the names for our show, we were like, hey, we might get more like search traffic this way. Uh, and apparently it worked. We, we, we got a Canadian to find us and uh, befriend us. So this is, <laughs> this is great. So Mechanical Dream Revolution, people will find that. Also, previous appearances, Scrooged, uh, Collateral. Um, gosh, you've been on like six times. Now. Lots of stuff. None of the Living Which Dead, you remember. Scrooged, Collateral. Yeah. Um, it's a wonderful life. It's a wonderful life. Um, Starship Troopers. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and then we did the one before that, right? That was collateral on Starship. Oh, okay. Troopers. I don't know. Back yeah, I invited that. myself to Starship Troopers because it's uh, my favorite uh, historical film. Prehistory. Historical. Or... Yeah, <laughs> it will be. It will be one day. It's the history of the future. <laughs> did you also do your your favorite movie of all time? Oh, the, the Warriors. Warriors. Yeah. Yeah, we did that too. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like, what are you guys going to even talk about? And then we talked for like five hours or something. Yeah. And that, that one plays. Yeah. Uh, Still heavily. oversold that movie. That's It's good. It's good. Uh, and and, and the, the music for that is very good. And you have mm. pilfered that, I, I should say. Uh, yeah, that kind of got me. Yeah, that got me through the end of Boys Will Be Boys. And. Uh, I'm kind of reapproaching some of those ideas without going back to the well the way like a hack in Hollywood was would. I'm being very careful not to try to double dip, but uh, yeah, there's some pretty really good like synthesized slashed slash like rock music in the Warriors that I just love. Yeah, I. I, I won't deny that in watching the the movie for the episode, I had not seen it prior to that. And I was very surprised that the soundtrack was as, as good as it was. So anyway, we're not here to talk about that. That's, that's, that's the, no, this movie has a good soundtrack too, though. I've heard techno remixes of this shit. Okay. Send, send, send it my way. I'll put them on the show notes page. Last slash 114. but let's get into this. No. If, <laughs> if we may, uh, we start with the Google description. Last of the Mohicans, The Last of the Mohicans, came out in 1992. So it's actually quite old at this point. Uh, it is a two-hour and two-minute film 
by Michael Mann, 7.7 IMDb, 95% Rotten Tomatoes, 3 out of 4 from Roger Ebert, and 90% of Google users liked it. The description is the last members of a dying Native American tribe, the Mohicans, Uncas, his father, Chingachuk, and his adopted half-white brother, Hawkeye, live in peace alongside British colonists. But when the daughters of a British colonel are kidnapped by a traitorous scout, Hawkeye and Uncas must rescue them in a crossfire, in the crossfire of a gruesome military conflict of which they wanted no part between the French and Indian War. Uh, came out September 25th, 1992, uh, director Michael Mann, as I said. This is adapted from a book and also a film from the 1930s. It won a few Academy Awards. And it has, of course, the uh, talented actor Daniel Day-Lewis, who is the only actor to win three Best Actor awards in all of history. Three Oscars for Best Actor. Not for one. Not one was not for this film, though. I think he did do a very riveting performance. Uh, Robert, let's go with your opening on the Last of the Mohicans, please. First of all, could you repeat the name of the father? Chingachuk. Yeah, that just sounds offensive somehow. I, it, I'm probably butchering it. Uh, it's Chinga, Chingachuk. Yeah, Chingachuk. Chingachuk. Yeah. So we didn't grow up. So it either you sounds don't... Klingon, or like some horrific, offensive term. Okay. Good. Well, um, I don't intend to offend, but you know, sometimes well, this movie. Is definitely a movie of its time. Uh, uh, didn't Michael Mann also do like Heat or something like that? Or is this somebody else? Yes. Oh, Michael Mann. Okay. And Collateral. Yeah, so he got better. Because this film, I it, it very much feels like a film that is taken from a larger work. Um, characters just kind of move around and we catch back up with them when there's something that the director feels like he needs to show us. I, I, I think it's very much a movie of its, its time. It felt like a, like a postman or a water world or a dances with wolves. There's the terrible fighting and there's a lot of fighting in this film and it's all really, really bad. There's been a lot of uh, improvements in that. The acting is all fairly decent and good. But, man, I had some issues with the script and just the story in general. The, um, the guy who ultimately decides the fate of our hero and heroine is some guy we meet at the very end. We don't even know him in the entire film. And then all of a sudden we just see him at the end. And then it's like, oh, OK. So the hero doesn't even get to decide his own fate. All right. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I... I will probably get into it. I'm sure I'm, I'm the one that hated this movie the most. So we'll just uh, have to see where this conversation goes. But um, overall, it's, it's, uh, it's not the worst thing I've ever seen. Uh, last week's was way worse. So who knows? What do you got? What do you got, uh, Michael or Daniel? Well, I just want to respond to you a little bit. So it's going to get better in 3.5. So that's good. Now, when you're referring to the, the fate of our hero and heroine, are not decided until someone we meet at the very end. Are you talking about the old elder of the Huron tribe? Is this is this who you are referring to? That's the guy I'm talking about, yeah. Okay, all right. And uh, in the pre-show, Mike and I, while you were having the connectivity problems, we were saying that if we dared try to do this without you, that I would have to assume the hater role of really not liking the film. Uh, but I'm glad that you're here because now I can actually be my normal role of liking the film so <laughs> what okay right. i thought i thought michael was going to be the lover and the defender of this film and we were just going to tag team hate all over it but i guess i'll be the solo <laughs> hater which is a fine it's a role i'm comfortable with so it'll be just fine <laughs> all right so michael we've given you plenty to work with already so uh, yeah, fair enough, man. Um, okay so basically my position is the opposite <laughs> i like it um, for some of the same reasons you mentioned, like, uh, the fates being decided, um, by people outside of their, their sphere and stuff, um, is, is kind of the, the theme of the film. Uh, a lot of people that like, like the book don't really like this movie because of all these vast differences, but I think that that's just, it's kind of like a shining situation where you can't really transfer it 
Um, but I really like this film because it talks a lot about how much of our our liberty and our destiny are decided by the alliances we make and the um, organizations we commit ourselves to. So that that being said, it makes total sense that that um, a First Nations chief would decide the outcome at the end without them really having met him. I don't know. It, it makes total sense because it's like the whole movie, they're just being tossed around by different governmental agencies uh, that go back when, on our word. If I was writing this book, I would have the protagonist actually protag. Oh, he does? Where the protag he does to a certain extent. You're right. He does do certain things. He makes certain decisions, especially I'm thinking of saving the people from the war party in the beginning, the, the group of soldiers with the ladies. And then when he, knowing the consequences, still helps the group of guys escape the fort. But... And he walks into the Huron village like a badass. Well, I mean, you don't have to agree with the what happens to him. I mean, I think that's the point, is that it's not just. Is that a bunch of terrible stuff is happening and it's not because he lacks merit it's because two governments are fighting each other and enlisting the the smaller governments of the natives that that live in that area like everybody is just allied to some organization and they're all have these like unions of power and the the destiny so of a single the, man the fascist in mike c is like loving like just masturbating all over this movie I no no this is the libertarian in me because this is very much uh lamenting his lack of liberty, how the frontier is being like devoured uh, and made into you know a bureaucratic nightmare, or or you know stomped over by by all these wars. Like he says it at the end, right? If you want to jump to the end, like it's like the frontier will disappear, and there won't be any room for like a man that just wants to like hack out his existence out of the wilderness, you know. It'll all be part of the system. So this is like man against society, which is very libertarian. I think that is uh, a lot of great themes in here to look at, right? Because like, how much I of your life? I will grant you that. Hmm. I will like, grant you that. There's definitely the frontier spirit of at one point. What the the girl is asking Daniel Day Lewis why anybody would possibly live out here outside the protection of what the state or the greater yeah. powers. And he's like, well, listen, they can't afford to live there and out here, at least they can get by on their own two hands and, and then she, de the she defends and it sort of thing. later to her father. Right. You know, or she's yelling at, um, at buddy who, who wants her. It's just like, they don't, they, they hack out their lives out of the wilderness, bearing their children on their back, you know? And, like, the idea of not supporting that, like, oppressing that is just horrific because they're they're taking on all the responsibility of their lives to go homestead at the edge of the world, and they're still getting fisted by government. Yeah, conscripted and not allowed to defend their own. Well, and heart. they had a contract, right? They had a, they had a legitimate contract. You know, they had his word, and then, and then when when push came to shove, he said, "No, you're not allowed to leave. I need your, I need you to be here as troops." It's like, well, then why did you even ask in the first place? Why didn't you just chain me up and bring me here? Well, it's not like the first time that a government would have lied to somebody to get them to do something, Mike. Yeah, they blew up those trade center towers or whatever too, right? Like, so <laughs> I'm just kidding. I don't actually believe that. No, but, but I can edit uh, that one out. <laughs> I could totally see them like just saying whatever needed to be said to get these guys to get yeah. into the position they needed them to be in. And then later on, yeah, of course not follow through on their contract. Yeah. Cause what are you going to do? You know, what are you going to do? Not bail out the <laughs> banks. <laughs> they are That's the just in that area. Us. All right. Without I government, like... <laughs> who would <laughs> kick people in the face? I feel like we're derailing already here. No, well, I don't know. I just, I really do think this is a libertarian film, and I like it because I, I think the theme is like basically your life is is defined by who you ally yourself to, your brothers and your community 
you know, and what governments you end up having to submit to. You know, whether you're rebelling or or helping them out or, you know, making hacking out some sort of sovereignty for yourself, you know. Right. I did like the angle of, you know, when that commitment was broken, then then all those uh, colonials were like, hey, if their laws, if their commitments aren't going to be met, then then we are being oppressed by them. It's like sort of dawning that realization and they react to it. You know, they they're like, well, fuck this. We're we're going to get out of here and we're leaving. That's good. yeah, I thought that that was uh, that was the appropriate response, um, and I don't know. There, there's there's a lot going on in this film. I mean, there's there's a, a bunch of layers, and and Robert, you were saying it was, it was like there were all these different stories, and it was a bit confusing. But I think if you um, step back and look at it, you know, they are kind of interweaving. You have all of these things happening, but they all sort of echo each other. You know, you've got these alliances, and you've got antagonism between these groups and then you've got a journey of uh sort of self-discovery especially with madeline stowe character who by the way she was she was really good looking in this film by the way um but you know she is this english daughter of a colonel living in london coming out to the wilderness and it doesn't take much for her to turn that corner and be like on the side of these people who are scratching their existence out of the earth and to see that they are noble and that what they're doing is just and that what her father and and the British government is doing there is, is terrible. And the French and the French and and all of the native governments. Yeah. I did want to talk about the French a little bit with the, uh, the general who, they bombard the the fort and come to terms for surrender. And he's actually very cordial about it. He like lets him have almost any terms he wants, as long as he hands over the fort. And I thought that was pretty, pretty telling. Um, but in the doc or in the um, director's commentary, Michael Mann was talking about how there is some truth to that because they only had so much time before winter would set in. This is Western New York back then. That was the frontier. <clears throat> yeah. But you can't make war in the snow very well, as Napoleon and Hitler discovered. Uh, so the French had to seize that fort as quickly as possible and move on because they were losing, basically losing daylight, right? They were losing the ability to make progress. And so that's why he gave those terms so acceptable to the British so that he could just move on to the next thing. So that in the film, it played out as he's being like overly nice and like very um, there's like sort of a code of conduct, yeah. you know, like the rules of war and, and oh. it, it seemed kind of almost refreshing to see something like that. But then it also makes like war itself so ridiculous because they're willing to talk so cordially to each other. Meanwhile, the cannon fodder people are just getting shot up and destroyed. And it's like... Yeah, the officers are treated like human beings where the cannon fodder and the privates and the lower ranking enlisted men are just like garbage to be used. Yeah, Yeah, and conscripted and and whatever, you know, and... Goodwill is good business, though, right? Is what I took from that. I mean, there's no point in being adversarial to your adversaries if you can make peace. It's beneficial for everybody, right? like you know when you complain to a business and then they're they try to like run interference on on you being satisfied by like not not rescheduling or not giving you your money back or whatever and you're like well i'm going to win this exchange for one and secondly i'm going to tell everybody i know now like you're you're you know yeah i've found that most of the time a business that doesn't have like a sort of protected racket will (laughs) will be focused on customers but if they have a geographic monopoly, like say a cable company or something, they're notorious yeah. shitty service. Yeah. yeah. So, but the, the sure. businesses that don't behave like that, that don't have a government backing them, go out of business, right? That don't, you know. And yeah, you could throw the odd person out of your restaurant or whatever, right? Like sometimes it's got to be that way. But you know, you can usually tell when when a place isn't going to be in business long when you know when they're dickheads to you. Um, and that's the same as taking a fort, right? Like there's no point in in trying to massacre these people if what you need is the fort and you need them to leave 
And all it takes is not shaming them for them to be willing to do that. But yeah, it is, it is like war is like sickeningly, uh, it's, it's gross, the, the death and the way they treat infantry. But yeah. Now, do you guys think that the French general knew that he was going to be leading them off to this ambush by Magua? Or was that later sort of concocted after the surrender had already been agreed to? Uh, well, they portray it as like an idea that he's convinced to by by Magua, right? Like they, yeah, they he Magua convinces. Wants, hmm? Magua wants revenge. Yeah, and I think he convinces. I mean, that's how they portray it. I'm not sure if I believe the likelihood of that. Maybe he was thinking that the whole time. But the French commander is like, "Yeah, you're probably right. You know what? Do your thing. I don't want to have anything to do with it." Right, because the French guy is like, well, I can't break the truce, but I'm not saying you can't. Yeah, so that's kind of, you know, if he sleeps at night, I guess that's, you know. That is one of the things I did like about this movie a lot, uh, is the humanization of Magua and his reasoning for being so single-mindedly wanting to murder the gray hair and his family. And I appreciated that. Yeah, yeah, he's like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna wipe out his seed. Like his genetic lineage is done. Yeah, yeah you know, that's hate speech now, isn't it? Bringing up the idea of hereditary. Not genes against and... a white man. No, I think even acknowledging the biology that they were discussing would have been, would have got you banned from YouTube. Would it though? Yeah, I just. I'm he's just... a he's a Native American talking about killing a white man. I don't think it's. No, no, no. I I, I just class. mean like like we're not supposed to talk about how like people have uh babies and those babies carry genes from their parents and that's like the driving, oh so you're the, saying the he's driving... probably the great great grandfather of Elizabeth Warren okay yeah yeah <laughs> something like that. All right, so here's another attack I want to take on this. And this this might be spicy, might be a little controversial. But one of the talking points about this is you've got native cultures, native peoples living in this land, and there's a variety of them. And you've got wave after wave of immigrants coming from Europe who go through some really terrible situations to get there, but they're coming there to seek a better life. Like they're going through... Uh, fleeing Europe, terrible situations in Europe. They're going through indentured servitude, paying that debt off before they can then go scratch out existence out into the wilderness. Mm -hmm. But they are not coming for, you know, the social welfare system. Yeah, the present day situation, you know. Um, More hate speech, man. You're looking to get banned off the internet. I know, I know. and But that's what's fucked up, right? Because the Indians in this are essentially the open borders position. Maybe not willingly, you know, but they're overpowered. They're not able to resist it successfully. I mean, maybe at the time, you know, in 1757, they... No, they, they had zero they chance of beating Europe. Do you think it was known at that time? I mean, the elder that, that gets introduced at the end and decides the fate of our hero sort of brings up that hey this has been a question ever since our white fathers came here yeah on what what are we as a people to do i think that if europe wasn't fighting europe in canada and the americas then they're they would have completely um subjugated the native population because they they, they needed the, they need they couldn't fight both wars the french and the and uh, the English, and for that matter, the Spanish, right? They couldn't fight those wars and the war against the the indigenous people. So they had to ally with them. Because it's like guerrilla, it's asymmetrical warfare too, right? You have to deal with like, England wants to fight France. They're dealing with the one set of tactics. And then you got to deal with guerrilla tactics as well. I don't, no, couldn't do it. Yeah, and it seems though, um, I mean, that was one of the big things with the Revolutionary War, the colonials did use guerrilla tactics against the British yep. who were very regimented in how they would fight, you know, wearing bright red, kick me here, target, uh, yeah, uniform. Well, bureaucracies build empires though, right? Like that's why the Romans were so powerful. It's bureaucracy and like 
system because you can always just get more people if you treat them like pawns right just throw them through the meat grinder but if you can but if if the rules of the system are maintained then the empire grows regardless of how many people you murder well to a point i mean yeah. eventually you do well, they all, yeah they collapse right <laughs> obviously they all collapse but um yeah but the successful yeah does this tie, tie into your um not liking the fighting in this so much robert or was it just like the how they portrayed it because to me in watching it you know you you get a musket and it takes like a minute to reload it so of course you just get the one shot or and... ranks ready well unless you're the hero i mean this is a time in, in hollywood when if you're shot by anybody else you're you might be okay but if you're shot by the hero you're instantly dead if you're even touched by the hero, you're instantly dead. He has a plot armor to the nth degree. He can run around the battlefield and nobody even tries to hit him. But he, uh, it just, it just reeks of, I mean, as I was watching the fights, I was just imagining how they would be done in today's time and how like there was a scene where he's handcuffed and they're being ambushed by Magua and all these, the, the, the Huron tribe, right? And he's handcuffed. And then there's just the next shot. He's taking off his handcuffs and he's just picking up a rifle. Well, in today's movie, I think they would add way more drama to that. They would have a scene where he's handcuffed to a guy and maybe the guard gets shot and dies, but then the key gets kicked off and he has to go chasing after this key as it's getting kicked around the battlefield. And maybe it'd be a little bit too ridiculous for this kind of movie, but at least it would have some kind of drama to the event. Maybe you could do it better than I'm just imagining it, whatever. But it just seemed like it was almost like Daniel day Lewis was this action hero, superstar movie star guy, because the team of three guys was taking on an entire war party of the Hurons. And it just seemed like they had plot armor to the nth degree and could do no wrong until the plot needed them to die. Eh, I just, it just reeked of old Hollywood, dumb Hollywood. Um, but dumb Hollywood isn't necessarily terrible. They can do character <laughs> and romance decently. Um, interpersonal conflicts, like those, those things were set up well in this film. Um, people had ideological differences and arguments, legitimate grievances against each other. That's good, nice and refreshing. We don't always get that, but you know, in some way Hollywood has progressed, and in some way they've regressed. Something, some ways they've they've gone for spectacle, and then they've forgotten character and story. So I. You could probably a re a remake of this movie would probably be worse than what it is, right? Because but it would you have get, really good action scenes. You get the spectacle that you're missing, but you but, wouldn't care because you wouldn't get the character or the story. So you'd just be like, "Well, this is pretty, but who gives a shit?" Right, and and if you had that, you know, extra ten minutes of him like trying to get the handcuffs off instead of just this magical, you know, Houdini style, he's free all of a sudden. Uh, yeah, they might add a little bit more drama to it, but by then the battle's over. <laughs> yeah, probably, but at least it would humanize him as a character. Instead, he's like this Superman that is unstoppable, and that's just boring. It's like, uh-oh, somebody's in danger. Oh, no, don't worry about Daniel Day Lewis is on screen, so that's no problem. It, yeah. it just doesn't. It just it doesn't create tension for me. Okay, well, just just so you're aware, Daniel Day Lewis, he is famous for becoming the character for the duration of the filming, even Offset. Like he was Hawkeye for like ten months, and he went through survival training, and he actually got to the point where he he could load a musket on the run in under a minute, and all of the action awesome. scenes and that's awesome. And all of the survivalist shit he was doing, like he he picked that up in intense training in preparation for the role. 
That sounds like Michael Mann's directing too, because like in Heat, they all fired, and, and in uh, Collateral, they all did live live ammunition training. Yeah, the the director's commentary was great. I mean, he, he has an encyclopedic knowledge of the events surrounding it, the historical things that are going on, but then also in the preparation for the role and why he shot things the way that he did. I will agree with you, Robert. The action sequences probably could have been done better. He does a lot of shaky camera and close up kind of stuff that's just sort of like, all right, you guys move here, you guys do this. And it's not well, uh, and there's a lot of like, okay, this extra, do this move and then pause while the hero kills you. As dumb. Go ahead, sorry. Could have been a little bit more fluid. They could have done some more Wu Ping shit. Yeah, uh, I just disagree entirely with both of you. Like it's just <laughs> Bring it on, Michael. Well, no, I just it's art, man. I can see reality out my window. <laughs> I can see people doing real stuff. And then conversely, if you want sensationalism, watch, you know, Avengers Endgame. I don't think there's any depth to that. It was a nice jerk off session, but um, I don't know. I just, I don't mind telling a story visually and having it be a little bit inco- or, um, unrealistic as long as it's, the geography is coherent and you know what's going on because it's, it's not just a logical experience. It's also an emotional one. You know, like it's okay for a for a for somebody to freeze and be killed on screen. Actually, that does happen in real life too, right? Like, I don't know if you've ever been petrified with fear, but it does happen. You know, every time. Uh, no, not every time. I'm just saying, like, yeah, it's maybe it's convenient that somebody does something this way, and then it, the the consequence is that the hero succeeds. But that is just the idea of heroism like this is what the greeks called character you know what i mean it's like your destiny is the character there's a fate there's a fate to the um to the events happening they transpire and you are you know simply the right person to fulfill this role in this story in that sense i mean i think that's the whole point of stories is to give us good examples so i mean whatever you guys can you can guys can lukewarm it or hate it all you want just well just just you're not gonna ruin my fun i'm not saying i didn't like it i'm just saying that i i can see where robert's coming from that they they probably had a certain set of tools to them at the time that there are better tools for actiony stuff today yeah i just i don't Certainly. i mean i'm not saying it makes a, or breaks a movie i could watch a terrible action scene in a great movie and still love the movie. I'm I just saying that yeah. there was a lot. There was a lot of action scenes in this film, and they were all done quite poorly. And it took me out of the movie. Fair enough. If you think they were that bad, then that's that's fair. It's a, I mean, there's no accounting for taste, basically. In the end, if, if you sure. Um, when it's that glaringly bad, I can't no, suspend I my disbelief. Yeah. I think of a a stunt man and the action star rehearsing that scene over and over again. And then they actually got it on film that time. And it's like, yeah, fair enough. Okay. You're just you're mean, taking me out of a story, it, man. It might be below the standard too. Cause if you look at like, you know, collateral and heat and shit, like the actions incredibly detailed, but like I said, I, I, I simply disagree with your, with your opinion on, on the action. I actually liked it a fair bit. Um, even though, yeah, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of cutaways and inserts where it's just kind of like, I guess, I guess, cheesy, right? It's just cheesy, but I like the Warriors, you know what I mean? So Yeah, you like the Warriors, so the there's garbage. no accounting for taste. It's okay. Exactly. So, Robert, what specifically stood out to you as, like, the most egregious? Was it when the cannon was firing uh, on the French uh, encampment and the guys, like, sort of, jumped sideways or whatever as the dolly shot was going by or was it i mean those dolly? no i mean those were those are all bad but those you know it's not over and over and over again it was it was the hand-to-hand combat almost entirely there's a lot of uh you know tomahawk and uh, rifle butt use in this film and you know i'm i'm not saying that Old Holly, you know, this makes or breaks a film. It's it's not the biggest of deals, but when your entire movie requires you to do the similar type thing 50 times, because there's a whole lot of times where Daniel Day-Lewis is taking out one Huron guy and then another Huron guy and then another Huron guy, and it's all pretty much the same kind of combat. 
try and do your best to make it look good. Try and make it not distractingly bad is all I'm saying. Well, I'm sure they tried their best, even if they failed. Are you saying that you didn't like the continuity? Like you would do a shot to the belly and do a wrap around before pulling out from the belly and then moving on to the next guy. Cause that, that was a choreographed thing. Like he learned to do that sort of melee combat in his, in the training and prep for the film. You could probably, maybe if, if George Lucas owned this film, he could, um, he could go back and change some of the scenes. That'd be ideal. See, uh, and then, now yeah. we got Mike is thinking. Now yeah, thinking. We could use, you could use some of the scenes from, um, that Assassin's Creed where it takes place during the Revolutionary War. Exactly. Just use some of those. Assassin's Creed 3. Perfect. Add a few screams and uh, make sure that Magua shoots first. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Clunky. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So not to belabor this point, but that's what I do. I will agree with you, Robert, to a, to a point. But then Uh-oh. also, I think it, it kind of ruins a bit of the story at the end. When we're up on this mountaintop, and Uncas tries to save his girlfriend. And Magua just kicks his ass, dispatches him almost right away. And then Russell Means just comes up there and is like, fuck you, Magua. And he does the same thing to Magua. Like, Magua seems yeah. invincible. And then all of a sudden, he is ineffective. So you're agreeing with me. The, 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 the main characters had plot armor and were an invincible machine of death. No, this so is the plot needed them to not be. That's horseshit. And then no. they're and then they're super gonna die. No, that's just a fight. Those those two fights in a row is brilliant because it's like you go so low, you're like, holy crap, this guy's unstoppable, and then Buddy just rolls in. Dodges the one hit and immediately hits him. And I'm assuming that's what like actual melee combat is like. You know, you don't get too many mistakes. Yeah, you know, I don't know. I didn't buy it should last 30 seconds. I, I just didn't oh, buy Mus- Russell Means being like this badass hand to hand combatant. But well, he, he did didn't. just see his dad or his son get killed. He also this- survived as long as he did on the frontier. So did you know all I mean? of them. Yeah. Just all saying. those here on guys, they're all survivors on the frontier. Yeah. They're so all trained killers. No. So sometimes they're two masters. You Dude, know. It, was, it, it felt like a Star Wars movie where Luke was just had a lightsaber and he's cutting through stormtroopers. That's what the that was that's what Daniel Day Lewis was killing Hurons. It, he's a hero. But the, I mean there's cases in in like, you know, Greek history or, you know, the Battle of um, Troy or whatever, where two heroes would start fighting each other and everyone would just stop and watch. You know, like, it was like, this is, you know, this guy's could kill you know, 20 people today and so could this guy. So, like, let's just see who wins this. You know, there's just a certain level of ability some people possess and it, it probably comes from experience. I don't know. So it's like watching Jordan, like Jordan's on the court and the other, everyone's just watching him. Well, yeah, but we're watching like, or or, uh, actually a contemporary version would be um, Curry versus, uh, who's our guy? My guy Curry? No, You got a guy? Well, the Toronto. You're Canadian. What are you talking about? Oh, the Raptors? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Why? He's, He's no longer with the Raptors, by the way. No, not Kawhi. No, our whole team was actually pretty good. Anyway, so you get these heroes that step up to the plate and they do battle or whatever. But again, this is a story. Like it's important to have I, heroes. I understand I it's a movie, Michael. This is what we do on the show. We watch movies. I I just, it feels pretty it's not a documentary to like, yeah, film in real time. I don't know. Do you ever watch Hard Boiled? Not no. in a long time. Okay. The John Woo. It's spectacular. And like, you know, it's, it's like one guy mows down a hundred people and they're all just basically there for him to kill and show his prestige and, and power. You know what I mean? Because that's just how storytelling works. Sometimes, sometimes it's, you know, it's about like a newspaper and it's really realistic. And this is, you know, I would say that last Mohicans is pretty realistic in a lot of ways. What? Um, I was, I'm a, you're not on board with Daniel's cheesy. Well, it's cheesy thinking, too, and that's what I like. I think about this is Michael like Mann. cheese melodrama, is what I think. Yeah, this is what I like about Michael Mann, though, is that uh, he 
he painstakingly tries to create um, a very real and deep world um, and then creates melodrama within that, which I find very interesting because I do like melodrama and and characters being driven by the plot or by, by the circumstance and not the other way around. It's just interesting. But it is maybe that's what irks you so much about it. It's a completely different style of storytelling. You know? You're and maybe as a libertarian, you're more about agency <laughs> in a story. Right? I I prefer agency in story. It's that's true. Fair. That's fair. Um Yeah. No, I, I'm, no, not, I'm not completely against the you're, idea you're saying, of a character battling against you know circumstance, circumstance and these powerful groups. That's well, that can be compelling. Well, what I mean though is that you say melodrama as an insult, like you say that as a criticism unto itself, and I'm like, yeah, it is melodramatic. You're right, but I have no issue with that. So if you're if you're opposed to melodrama, then yeah, you're not gonna like this or um. No, no, you can you I've, may I've, like his other work. I've enjoyed many melodramatic films. Fair enough. But yeah, it, it's definitely melodrama. Like it's, you know, oh, the world's on fire, isn't it? <laughs> That's yes. a sick line, man. That's a sick that line. Is. And he's like, yep, it totally is. Don't worry, I'll take care of you. And then they're like, do it. Do it. Did they? Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty good. I like, I like how, and this is old school Hollywood, when you have sex with one chick and then it's like meant to be. This is their soulmates now. Well, we do have a tendency to bond um especially women have like you know kind of a, a endorphin reaction that helps them bond to the males not so much males but i do feel like intimacy when i have sex with somebody and i do want to protect them and keep them around so uh, maybe not just the one but certainly i feel a sense of obligation and if but i all these, hmm? all these guys in the frontier i mean they are like alpha men i mean they had to survive all this hardship, so that made them tough. You know, they were honed in. Yeah, I've, yeah. This fire. whole alpha beta thing is like kind of irksome, in you know, because like how else do you describe it? Um, but like they're not. Yeah, they they are certainly like they have agency and they're accountable for their actions and have sort of self actualized, I guess. Um, but they're not like some jock. You know, running around banging chicks and pounding twelve beers, and you know, like in that sense. No, but yeah, they they've got themselves figured out, and they also know how difficult life is, and that they're almost lucky to have survived as long as they have, and how hard they've had to work. Yeah, and it also seemed as if you know when he was willing to die for the seditious act, which I don't know if you guys have ever looked into what sedition is definitionally. Um, uh, not adhering to the central banking system. <laughs> Close. Uh, actually, I actually had to look it up because you know you heard, you heard the word sedition used a lot uh, during the impeachment process yeah. for for Trump. Oh uh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> it's, oh my God. I I take it back. That actually is almost as entertaining as 2016. <laughs> but it's basically just speaking ill of the government. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't actually apply outside of the military, but because Trump is the head of the military or whatever, like the commander uh, in chief. God Emperor, I believe. God Emperor, whatever. You're going to retake Constantinople and make it, it uh, yeah. It apparently applies to him. But when the British were, were speaking of it, they were like, that's a seditious act. We're going to kill you as a result. I mean, that is like a death, a, 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 <laughs> like an immediate death threat. If you speak ill of the government, yeah. we will yeah. kill you. Well, okay, so um, not uh, failing to adhere to conscription is like an imprisonment, but on the battlefield, uh, desertion is uh, death, right? Because the penalty ne needs to escalate the closer you get to um, the negative thing that you're trying to force somebody to participate in. So you need to you need to right. if you wanna if you wanna keep people in line, you have to escalate the closer they get to wanting like to a situation that's gonna make them rebel. Um so the the term decimation, right, was a I think it might have been Roman. Roman. Yeah, yeah where like, you kill every tenth part? you kill every tenth uh soldier, just execute them to uh 
realign morale to the state. Motivate, help properly yeah. motivate the rest. Yeah, mo motivate them back in line, right? So it's like any kind of mutiny, you know, death. Yeah, you go against the system, you get, you get, you know, fuck around, find out, <laughs> right? So they're basically examples. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to set an example if you want to oppress people. Because like the entire system is based on fear, right? You need that Death Star to like blow up Alderaan, or else people will rebel. All right, so Mike, um, we are going to have to start winding down pretty soon here. But I wanted to ask, what was the motivation for this particular film to be selected? Because well, you and I, we converse through Messenger time to time, share some memes, links of new songs, etc. Meme friends. Meme friends, uh, but you you also mention a lot of films that you watch, and I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Do you want to do that one, or do you want to change from? You know, you've said you want to do Mohicans a few months ago. Uh, do you still want to stick with it? And you said yes, I still want to stick with it. So, uh, I lay the question back to you. Uh, what wh what made you want to stick to this one, and what point do you wish to convey in the final minutes here before we uh, start to wind down? Well, I. Uh, I think the themes of this film, uh, what I like about it is that it talks about how uh, a person's destiny is often dictated uh, by the alliances we choose, what we submit to, the communities we form. Um, and so, you know, what, you know, you, you, you make some bogus consumer choices, it doesn't really affect your destiny too much, but you ally to a state, you join the army, you know. Um, you make alliances between your your neighbors, you know, to to defend your community. These things greatly affect the outcome of your life, I think, right? Especially in frontier lands. So I, I like I like the way this film addresses like a lot of these ideas in a in a melodramatic way. Like that, it's kind of a very very ancient storytelling where you know, and yeah, I mean, it's kind of lame. Some of the some of the plot armor is ridiculous, and some of the some of the conveniences are, you know, the contrivances are ridiculous, but uh, for the most part, it's just the story of like a hero doing uh, heroic things and trying to to navigate all of the external pressures that uh, exist because of these different unions of force in your life, right? So you form, you know, you got the farmers come together and they're like, okay, we represent a small, um, you know, uh, union of force that we could defend this land against the British government because they're busy fighting the French. But it's you know maybe it's also good to to ally to you know the British government because they did they did you know stabilize this region for us possibly. I mean that was his argument is that like they they did see themselves as British citizens and they liked the rule set that that government was providing. Uh, and then they found out later that. Uh, that they should have done more research about, you know, whether or not they follow their own rules and it ended up being tyranny. So it's just like the, those kinds of choices completely dictate the outcome of your life. So that's why I like it. Um, yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's all I got. All right. And I also think that you're a Michael Mann fan. Yeah. So yeah. That plays a role. Uh, and Heat is another movie that um, I haven't seen in a long time, but I, I recall it being very long, but also very good. And Doc Kilmer being pretty badass as perfect. <laughs> like you can't even make it. Yeah. Now there, there was the director's cut of this, and Robert and I—that's what we watched because that was the one that I was able to buy. But I had heard that the theatrical version actually has a. Russell means speech that is missing from the director's cut. And a lot of people um, who, who are aware or, and familiar with both say they really miss that speech. So Mike, are you familiar with that speech? And what is, yeah, the, I think, yeah, I think he said something about like um, the frontier uh, doesn't belong to us. My people, it belongs to people like my, my white son with one, one foot in, in this like, you know, primal lifestyle and one foot in civilization um and eventually that that won't even exist something something to that end that wasn't in the director's cut there's a bit of it at the very end but then he speaks of himself as being the last of the mohicans because yeah. and it was i thought that that was almost a slight against his against hawkeye who is his adopt or you know well, no, adopted. he's adopted and he's not 
he's he's white. He's not brown. Like right, but, but, but it's the son. end of his lineage. It is his son. One of them. Philosophically, it's his son, and he loves his white son. He said, you know, but <clears throat> ultimately, his seed is not going to keep going. I think that that was you know one of the central uh, themes in the in the in the movie as well. It's like you know your children and and finding a mate, and you know like he was the Mogwai's obsession with with killing the lineage of um, Cora's dad. What's his name? Monroe, Colonel Monroe. Monroe. You know, killing his lineage and telling him, like, I have you, your genes will not continue. You know, so that addresses uh, the biological imperative that drives, you know, 98% of our motivation. Wealth accumulation is all about, you know, finding a mate and providing for a mate and creating a, you know, a safe environment to propagate yourself in, you know, copy yourself forward. Yeah, I would oh. imagine that these uh, the people in 1750 willing to scratch their existence out in this wilderness were looking towards generational impact. You know, yeah. like otherwise certain... they would just sorry, but yeah, yeah otherwise but... they would just flip their house and not provide their children with a future. You know what I mean? They'd set up a social welfare system that can't be supported, and you know, sell their country off to other countries and create a bunch of government. Oh, I'm sorry. Just started thinking about the boomers suddenly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that was, that was a fine answer to the, why you wanted to do this film. So let's get into some final summary and review. And uh, we'll lead off with the hater thoughts from oh, uh, shit. over there. And then we'll, we'll, we'll eat it up a little bit with me. Probably like it a little bit more, and then we'll we'll finish with you, Mike. Okay. Well, I don't have a lot of deep thoughts. I feel like Jack Andy over here. I'm glad we've got Michael C. He's always a very deep thinker, and he brings a lot of interesting ideas. I think he likes movies for good reasons. He always has good reasons for why he likes movies. Even if I hate the movie, he finds some reason to like it, which doesn't really occur to me. So, yeah, there are strong libertarian themes in this film, but the rest of the crap was so distracting that it almost didn't matter to me when it should. I should appreciate this film for its strong libertarian themes, but I guess it just annoyed me that this superhero character was just mowing his way through the movie that I, uh, I don't know, it just, it just bugged me, I guess. Um, I am a man fan as well with you guys. I, I think we've done Collateral and we could easily do Heat. Both are excellent films. I think Collateral is a little stronger, but you know maybe he learned a few things since he's gotten older. And um, I don't know how old he was when he did Mohicans, but he still he still obviously got some some talent. He knows a little bit about story, but he was directing or he's adapting a film another film, and then also a book. And it very much feels like an adaptation to a book to me. Uh, it, it reminded me of like watching Lord of the Rings and knowing the book, Lord of the Rings, because I'd read the book, Lord of the Rings, and going, oh, so they're not going to include that. Oh, they're not going to include that. Uh, you know, Oh, it's jumping over to this scene now. Oh, okay, I see that's a kind of conglomeration of this and that and this character and this scene. It it just felt like the story jumped around and the characters were conveniently in this area or that area. and I, uh, It just, the whole thing just kind of bugged me. It's the best I can put it. It's the, it's the film just bugs me. It's not great. It's not bad. It's just kind of unsettling. So I can't give it a positive review. I can't give it a negative review. I think if you're into historical movies, historical like uh, fictional movies like this, like a Dances with Wolves or Glory or maybe a Postman. I don't know. I haven't seen Postman in a long time, so I don't know if that's any good or not. But we'll probably end up doing it at some point. We will. Uh, maybe, you, maybe you'll enjoy that. Maybe you'll enjoy this. But I, I really didn't enjoy it too much. I watched it all the way through without much 
problems, but uh, that's about as much as I could say. I'm glad Mike C is here to uh, shower some love on it because I, I really can't. I can give it a five, five point zero, and it's and that's as hatery as it gets. It's it's an average film, especially considering its its age. So that's actually high praise because I could go negative. I could go really <laughs> negative. Well, maybe maybe our conversation has has brought it up a little bit. So if if we had scored it earlier, you might have given it like a four. Uh, That'd but, be fun to do sometime. Yeah, give us a the pre score and then post score kind of uh, debate style, Oxford oh, yeah. style debate. Yeah, that is, that is an intriguing idea. So we open with a score and then we try to convince each other. Yeah. Of why? Yeah. Yeah, but like, yeah. like a could, stock market or like a currency. Yeah, I could argue the negative, and then Mike could argue the positive, and see how far we move. That'd be good. It'd be fun. Okay. All right. Well, we'll we'll put that on the on the burner of great ideas. We probably won't do. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm I'm going to say that I uh, I enjoyed this film probably more than you did. I mean, you can see I'm in this wonderful forest here. We're doing, uh, of course, live streaming for our Patreon supporters at lastnight.com/slash/patreon. You can see us. I've got a green screen. We've got video feeds and all that. And you can also view this on YouTube uh, at our YouTube channel. So do check that out and get the tribes going. We got to get over 100 on uh, last night. Get that domain. So hook us up. We'll subscribe. So we'd appreciate it. So my review of the film is pretty positive. I think Michael Mann is a great director. I think maybe he he had challenges with the practical uh effects that were available at the time with the uh the fight scenes and all of this but there was a lot of preparation that went into this he shoots the scenes for specific purposes they're there for a reason and we find a uh, very strong messaging in this there's a lot of interweaving things going on and the antagonist magua i mean we see why he's motivated to do what he uh does in this film so it's not like everything is black and white cut and dry uh, you know, oversimplified, oversimplified. There's a lot of nuance and a lot of complication going on in that. And I really appreciate a movie like that. Uh, it probably could have been a little bit less of um, an unstoppable Terminator style, but you also need to have this character make it to the end. Otherwise, you really don't have a film. So I don't know how they could really have done that differently. And maybe like you were saying, Robert, maybe a little bit more tension with uh, some harrowing escapes, but he did kind of submit himself to being hung uh, for helping the other guys escape. So, you know, I mean, that's a little bit of tension, a little bit of drama, and he he does get out of that situation. So I'm not sure exactly what could be done differently, but I, I found it to be a very fun watch and um, beautifully, beautifully shot. And, and I'm glad that it was recommended. I'm going to go with 7.5 on this and uh, we'll go to Mike. Okay, yeah, yeah. No, you can have allergic reactions to films, I think. Shit can irk you, and you just don't like it. I mean, that's fair. Um, yeah, I don't know. I haven't got too much more to say about it, though. I think I've kind of covered the 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 spectrum of, of why I like it. Um, and yeah, I got a hard-on for Michael Mann. But uh, this is not maybe his best film, but uh, yeah, I, I don't know. 7.5, 8, 8.5, 8, I guess would be the average between those two. I think it's I think it's great. I think that people can get a lot from it, um, and it's not a bad date movie. A lot of girls kind of like watching it with me, so it's like well, not a lot, but you know what I mean. Well, like, Daniel uh, Day Lewis had to get pretty hunky for this one. I guess he put on something like twenty or thirty pounds of muscle. Yeah, I wouldn't throw him out of bed for eating crackers. <laughs> there was one quibble I had, and that was the opening scene where he's running through the forest, and he's got. <sighs> musket and a uh, shirt on and then moments later he's shirtless he's been running this whole time so <clears throat> i don't know where his shirt ended up uh same but, place as uh kirk's james d kirk's shirt ends up <laughs> <laughs> probably no i get it you're right like i mean there are there are, are some failings it is a little bit cheesy or maybe even a lot cheesy but i like cheese so well yeah yeah of course so anyway, uh, that's our show for tonight, everyone. Um, you can support the show by giving us likes and subscribes on YouTube uh, and uh, what else? iTunes, podcasts, Apple Podcasts, whatever they call that these days. 
You can also hit us up on the old Patreons, lastnighters.com slash Patreon. You get pre-show content, almost an hour of it for this episode, and also post-show content, which we affectionately call Kathleen Turner Overdrive. Uh, and that's at lastnerves.com slash Patreon. This is episode 114, where the show notes will be found at lastnerves.com slash 114. And you'll find links to all of Mike's prior appearances and also his music at Mechanical Dream Revolution, which can be found on SoundCloud. You can also find links to trubster.com, which is Robert's merch site. He's got his art plastered on things that you can give him fiat currency in exchange for. And you could be uh, riding in style, walk, walking around town, wearing these t-shirts with uh, his designs on them. I highly suggest checking out trubster.com. That's two Bs. Is that correct, Robert? That's two Bs for a double dose of the bubs. <laughs> double dose of the bubs. T-R-U-B-B-S-T-E-R. Uh, that will also be on the show notes page, of course. And uh, we will be back. Uh, just in case tonight's episode wasn't enough toxic masculinity for you. We're going to double up next week as we bring back the professional asshole to talk about the Mel Gibson flick, Edge of Darkness. So that one should be a lot of fun. Uh, I, Mike's already got some comment here. <laughs> Nothing. I just said you could have done the Patriot, which is like basically this plus um, uh, Roland Emmerich. Do you know what I mean? Like if Roland Emmerich made uh, Last of the Mohicans, it'd be the Patriot. Uh, Mel, our guy, fucking <laughs> Gibson, what a guy! Oh, man. He's a legend, yeah. man. You can you can edit that out if you want. <laughs> it's like, man, the guy has just got no chill, no chill. Well, we'll be back with that for next week, and uh, I guess uh, Robert has dropped momentarily. Technical difficulties. Uh, he was hanging for a minute, unlike Jeffrey Epstein. But we'll be back next week with <laughs> darkness. Uh, thank you, Mike. And we will uh, see you guys all next week. Stay healthy, my friends. Good night from last night.